คงเช่นตาตาสัมเทนเวเชฟาเฟเจอีเชจงสันเช่นจามเมียวฟารุนเจ้าดาวโอมันรู้ฮะเลี้ยวสันทอสลีคุตะลาสุจันอูสันเวลาสังกาเวกฤตวัชิวเอาอัลคอมเพชชั่น for the set of this assembly and all living beings present the wonderful Dharma will to teach us How to live suffering and attempt bliss and e m p e r and death and quickly realize none but. Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Saranto Suchedoye Olahudi Samyao Sanputoshi. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa, Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu, Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi, Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand. The Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good evening. Welcome to our Sutra lecture tonight. This is the 19th of October. We're heading into Scorpio territory, and we're going to be looking at the Flower Garland Sutra, the ten stages chapter, the ninth stage. And let's begin with an invocation of the Buddha's name and the Bodhisattvas who bring us the Sutra. And also, I'd like to say welcome to those who are listening in Australia and translating the sutra for listeners in China. How does that work? Through the miracle of the internet. And welcome as well to all of you watching on YouTube in the present and in the future. So, if you look at the front of your sutra, right there, you'll see. Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yan Jing Hua Yan Hai Hui Fu Pu Sa. That's what we're going to be chanting. Here we go. Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yan Jing Hua Yan Hai Hui Fu Pu Sa.
sound like a harpsichord. So the purpose of that is to honor the source of a sutra and to kind of put ourselves in line with uh, that source. The Chinese say, yin shui su yan. When you drink the water, your gratitude reminds you where it came from. And it puts you in that flow through the present into the future. So, um, our text, we want to open to page 94, 95. I appreciate everybody who's come out tonight. It's a chilly night here in Berkeley. Autumn has truly come. And there are lots of other things you could have been doing on a Saturday night, but you decided to spend your time with the monks and tonight with the goddesses as well. We're midstream in uh, praises by goddesses, right? So if we, we could advertise that. We could put neon out in front of the monastery and say, never mind Beyonce. I mean, who cares about Beyonce? We've got goddesses tonight. <laughs> I mean, Beyonce is pretty great, but goddesses, right? From, the, from Devi, Tenu, oh my goodness. And truly, I mean, what they appear. The Abhatamsaka Sutra contains the praises, the songs sung by Tenu, who are the best singers probably in Jambudvipa in our world. And uh, they're there praising the Buddha. Here it is. I mean, do you take it at face value? That's what it says. Uh, if you want to know how goddesses sing and what they, what they say when they do that, that's our, our, our text tonight. How cool is that? So we start on the second stanza, page 94, Mao Duan. Oh, it's the first tone. Mao Duan, Duan, first tone. Mao Duan, Fo Zhong, Wu Yu Shu. Got it? Okay, and then the English is the number of Buddha's assemblies gathered on a hair tip are beyond counting. Okay, are we ready? Try it. Here we go. I'll give you a line, you give it back. Mao Duan, Fo Zhong, Wu Yu Shu. Right, ready? Together in unison, ready? The number of Buddha's assemblies gathered on a hair tip are beyond counting. The joys of beings' minds are also infinite. He can match their wishes and teach them Dharma practices. Throughout the Dharma realm, it is that way as well. Okay. So, um, this is the Flower Garland Sutra. We're learning about how bodhisattvas become bodhisattvas, what they learn, what they know. And our ninth stage bodhisattva is a great communicator. It's a great Dharma master. And the text is all about how he has now developed a phase of his uh, mind. He's trained his mind so that he can hear everything that people ask him and make a single sound and answer them. Not only answer them, but make them happy and resolve their doubts. And if we accept the premise of the sutra, it's perfectly, quote, natural. It's not bizarre. This is not, uh, you know, an enhanced human being. This is not AI in action. This is actual carbon-based humanity, not silicon-based humanity. You can do it. I can do it. It's just that people haven't translated. They haven't, either they haven't learned the Chinese to read it in the original um, or the Sanskrit uh, or they didn't, didn't think of it this way. People tend to look at the sutra as something uh, otherworldly, sacred and holy and, and uh, impenetrable, too lofty, or worse, they think it's superstition and nonsense and don't even take it seriously. So, um, based on our teacher's daily encouragement for nine years, we learn to look at the sutra as a handbook, as a kind of a, he, he would call it a mirror, where you see your true face, or he'd call it a blueprint, where you understand how we're, how we're built, 
where the doors are, where the windows are, how the, the pathways go. So with that approach to the sutra, it's like, well, my curiosity just says, what does it say? You know, what, what's in it? What does it say? So it's interesting that when it comes to the, these are, we're in the repeating verses part. And every, every stage has text, prose, then verses that repeat. And this section is put in the mouths of goddesses. And that's not, I'm not using goddesses as an adjective. I mean, actual, real female gods, right? Devis, not devas, who live in the heavens. And they're heavens, plural, multiple. And they're moved by the Buddha. They like what the Buddha does. And they're praising the Bodhisattva using the Buddha's... Uh, uh, they're, uh, where there are Buddhas, there are Bodhisattvas, and they're talking about them both and what they can do because of what they've accomplished in this phase of their education. So, okay, are we all... Is that possible? I mean, do, does that catch your imagination? It does mine. The numbers of Buddha's assemblies gathered on a hair tip are beyond counting. So a hair tip, tiny hair, that's pretty, pretty fine. And if you take the tip of a hair, Maoduan, and to say on that tiniest thing, the largest thing, Buddha's assemblies, filling up space, are too many to count. So, okay, that's clearly an inconceivable state. Furthermore, the things that make people happy in their hearts are also beyond counting. What makes you happy in your heart? You know, right? So, it's not one thing, it's many things. And if you take all the numbers of beings and all our happinesses, this bodhisattva can match their wishes and furthermore take them out of the ordinary. He can say, yeah, all that, you know, like, uh, what is it that you enjoy the most? Would it be like really good poor tea? <laughs> what? No. Starbucks? No. Not Star no. What would it be? Oh, gelato, right? The best kind of gelato. What would it be? What is it that makes you happy? Nothing that touches your tongue. Maybe it's like money in the bank. Maybe it's watching your mom be pleased with you and not criticize you. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, maybe it's hearing praise from your dad. Uh, things that really touch our hearts. Infinite in number. This bodhisattva knows what those are and provides them, but then cranks it up a notch and says, that worldly stuff is good, but what about dharma practices that give you wisdom and transcendence so you can actually get altitude on, I'm unhappy today, oh, I'm delighted today, oh, I'm feeling really bummed, oh, I'm just ecstatic, you know, kind of a bipolar shifting from, from grief to joy. Go beyond that, go, go way beyond that. Learn the dharma and understand where you came from, and how you grow, and how you age, and how you leave, and how you return. All of those bigger systems, right? A, sy a system attic, a systematized, a systems level view of human life. And throughout the Dharma realm, it's that way as well. The devas say, it's this way in a hair chip, and then whoop, they make it universal in scope, and they say, same everywhere. Every hair tip, it's the same. That's what devas, female devas, sing about when they sing. Pusa qin jia jing jin li, fu huo gong de zhuan zeng sheng. Wen chi er suo, zhu fa men, ru di nang chi yi che zhong. The bodhisattvas grow in vigor and strength. The Bodhisattva grows in vigor and strength. He gains meritorious virtues, increasingly sublime. He hears and sustains many gateways to the Dharma, just as the earth holds all the many seeds. Okay, here they're praising the Bodhisattva's capacity for knowledge. Right? This is a ninth stage Bodhisattva. He's way ma more mature than he was at the first stage, which was, as we were explaining it, long, long time, years ago, 
He's grown in vigor and strength, and he's almost graduated, but he's still studying. He hasn't slacked off. He hasn't, you know, what do they call it? Uh, like you're a month from graduation or two months from graduation where you, you kind of go into the lame duck period. What do they call it? Senioritis. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't experience senioritis. He's at the ninth stage. He could. He could go, yeah, well, you know, I, I'm irreversible, man. I'm, I'm irreversible. I like, I, I, you know, I'm chilling. <laughs> no, senioritis for the Bodhisattva doesn't happen. He just, now he's able to save more living beings. Why not? If you had to say why not, the answer would be vows. The things that make a Bodhisattva get up in the morning are practices and vows. And the practices only get better. Your meditation gets quieter and quieter and your mind expands and expands as it grows still. And that's, uh, that's a wonderful flavor. You don't, you don't get tired of that. And the vows say, I'm going to become a Buddha, but I'm the process by which I become a Buddha is helping people end suffering, getting people over their pain. So how hard is that? So here's, here's an example of how hard it is. So uh, uh, one of our, I won't tell his name, it's embarrassing to tell his name. One of our, our good layman, young man, graduated from our school, came out to his car this morning. Came at the monastery to, to uh, we had a funeral this morning, he helped out with the funeral. And he was going to go move his car and he went out and looked at the front tire and here was a, praying mantis, a female praying mantis, about that long, big. And I don't know when is the last time you looked at a praying mantis's triangular head, right? Their heads are triangular, and half of it was eyes. Half of their head are these two eyes. And apparently, praying mantises are among the, maybe the only other species that has 3D vision like people do. So, according to Wikipedia. So, he didn't, it was on his tire. If he had rolled the car just two feet, he would have squashed it, right? And what's more, the praying mantis was extremely pregnant. It was just all like that. So what did he do? He kindly took a leap and he said, oh, where do I put it? He lifted his trunk and put it in the trunk of his car, planning to take it, you know, to release it somewhere. So... So I'm coming down and it's, it's like I'm early for the funeral ceremony. He goes, uh, Audrey, uh, could I show you something? And I'm like, yeah, why not? So I have a minute. So we, <laughs> we go outside. He, he lifts the trunk and what? Here's the praying mantis and here's the eggs all laid on the top trunk lid of his car. <laughs> inside, right? Inside. This white bulb of praying mantis eggs about the size of your thumb. And here's the mom, and she's like watching us like this. And it's so clear that we're on this praying mantis's radar, and she's like watching us and watching her eggs. And okay, what are you going to do? You know. And we're, I guess, we passed the good vibe test. We didn't freak her out. She didn't feel she had to defend or attack or anything. This is giant, big insect, you know. And uh, so we're. What do you do? So immediately, what do you do? You, you go to the internet immediately, right? We called Lindsay Wildlife Experience in Walnut Creek here in the Bay Area. We have this wonderful animal rescue organization called the Lindsay. They, they changed their name. It used to be Lindsay Museum. Now it's Lindsay Wildlife. And we call them, hello, this is Lindsay Wildlife. Do you have an animal to rescue? Please stay on the line. You know. So we have a... We have a, a uh, a mother praying mantis and her eggs on the inside of our car trunk. What do we do? You know, how do we feed them? How do we? And so, so we're thinking of all the things to do, and maybe we'll put her in a jar. You know, and just the reality of having this insect that was watching us so carefully to see what are we going to do next. And here's her eggs, and this you know this egg sac inside is full of baby praying mantises, and we're like thinking. Man, living beings. <laughs> the, I know a lot of people would just squish it, you know, just 
yicky insect. And yet, of course, we're not going to do that. But do we remove it from the inside of the trunk lid? It was on this kind of this knit fabric part. It was really stuck on there hard. And if we move it, do we hurt it? And is the mother going to freak out when she sees the human? Or is she going to understand? And uh, I left my number with Lindsay. And they said, please call back. <laughs> they're so busy on a Saturday. Of course, they're not going to call back for my praying mantis. They have, they're rescuing foxes and possums and things like that. So, so uh, anyway, we're kind of on our own. But just the reality of this uh, very sentient pregnant creature, a mother, it's a mother raising her children on the inside of a, of a Toyota vehicle. And if we leave her in the trunk, she won't be able to feed them or, or herself. But if we take her out, maybe she'll, you know, get injured or the eggs or whatever. So how challenging is it to be a living being and make your way through the world? And uh, it just the whole, uh, the ocean of suffering was right there in, in the, on the trunk, you know. And yet the potential for, for happy praying mantises to come out of that experience is all there too. She was there with her with her legs all folded up, you know, watching us, and her head is swiveling around. And uh, the last time I saw a praying mantis uh, reality was in New York last weekend as the monks from Shaolin Monastery were doing praying mantis kung fu on stage at Lincoln Center. And uh, praying mantis is enough of a... Uh, a sentient being that the, the monks of Shaolin Monastery imitated its actions, its motions in their martial arts. Anybody who's seen Kung Fu Panda knows about, who are they called? The what? The, the Fierce Seven? No, what's their name? Kung Fu, the, the panda wants to, uh, Po wants to join the group. What's it called? Oh, come on, you guys. Counting on you. There's, what are they? The, 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 the Fierce Seven, or the, the Ferocious Five, is that what they are? And, and uh, Wu Gui is their, their Shifu, you know? The Fearsome Five, one of which is a, is a praying mantis. So, anyway, so that was my encounter today with, uh, with the, the Bodhisattva's challenges, you know. He can't be a Buddha until all praying mantises are crossed over, you know. How amazing. That is. The Furious Five. The Furious Five. That's right. Poe becomes number six. So the Bodhisattva grows in vigor and strength. He doesn't quit until the praying mantis babies are happily grown. He gains meritorious virtues, increasingly sublime. He hears and sustains many... What's a gateway to the Dharma? It's what we used to call a Dharma door. A Dharma door. Dharma doors are ways of practice and uh, are... Mahayana tradition is, has 84,000 of them. Uh, I'm going later next month to, uh, actually two months from now, to Malaysia for Buddha Root Farm Malaysia number three. Jin Ho Shir went, Jin Chuan Shir went, and my turn this time. And uh, we were talking about what we were going to, what's our topic this year at Buddha Root Farm Malaysia. And I thought we should do a, do an end run. We should do, do proactive, uh, what do we call it? Um, there's a word for this, where you head them off at the pass. And our topic would be 84,000 methods of practice, what's the best one for me? Right? Because why? That's the question everybody asks. All the, the, the hardworking, sincere lay people say, well, Dharma Master, I, uh, I get up in the morning and I recite uh, five Sharangama mantras before Zhao Ke, and then I do 108 Great Compassion mantras in the Earth Store Sutra, and, and I recite the Buddha's name for an hour, but I really want to know which is the best one. Should I, should I add the Vajra Sutra, Dharma Master? Right? And, and definitely the attitude is more is better. And uh, they're incredibly vigorous lay people. You know, and they, they have their work list of Dharma practices. So he hears and sustains many gateways to the Dharma. 
And now that's what is it? Hear and sustain. One chi. There's a lot. There's a lot there in those two words. Here's our bodhisattva. What did I say? Their their skill is in practices and vows. That's what makes a bodhisattva different from before. And what do you do? You hear. You hear somebody a new way of cultivation, and then you chi. Chi is actually there's a character. It's the second one on the four, the. Th- the second character in the third line, one chi, it's got a hand in it, a hand radical, and you actually, it's like you pick up a practice. And the second part, the right-hand side, is just a phonetic. So you grab onto, you, cl- you, you grasp, you pick up a dharma, a gateway to the dharma, right? You hang on to it. And chi also means to, to sustain. You maintain it, you sustain it. You do it more than once. And that's, that's really how it is with practices. Um, and so you have to use wisdom as you, as you start, because why uh, monasteries and communities are famous for having like uh, plagues of practices go through, kind of like a, a uh, um, what is it, a con- a c- not, not conjunctive, a... What's what's an a, f- a flu? It becomes a a which? Not an epidemic. It's a it's a not a plague. It's an adjective. It becomes a a what disease? Senior contagious. That's the word. Contagious. A contagious disease. There can be a contagious practice. Contagious set of practices where somebody says, well. I decided I was going to fast for 18 days. Oh yeah, well, me too. You know, you can't fast. Be- I'm, I'm going to fast faster than you are. I'm going to be the faster, fast, fastest faster that you ever seen. You know, so everybody's fasting slowly. You know, let's let's fast quickly, and it happens. And then uh, you have to use wisdom. And I am not immune to that. I did my first 18-day fast because it was kind of the thing to do at Gold Mountain Monastery. And halfway through it, I was in misery. And Master Hua came around and said, this is not your Dharma door. He said, don't do this again. <laughs> you really shouldn't do that. Though I learned that fasting is not for me. Too much fire. Uh, my Huo Qi took over. Uh, I was with my, uh, actually, uh, the monk whose name was Hangzhou, Gary, Gary Leinbarger and I were always kind of pacing each other in Chan sessions. We'd sit next to each other and I wouldn't drop my legs until he dropped his legs. And, you know. <laughs> oh, I heard it. Okay. Mm. You know. <laughs> and fasting was the same way. And he, he also had a lot of fire in his nature and so fasting turned out not to be good for him either. Dharmaster Hung Lai, on the other hand, is in the Ayurveda world is called kapha. Kapha is earthy and phlegmatic. And did he eat or did he not eat? He doesn't even know. Did kind of Doug Powers the same way? It's like well, some peanut butter and raisins is all I need. That's fine, you know. Did I eat it? I think so. You know, I don't remember. Hung Lai fasted for 18 days, and then another 18 days, and then the third time, 36 days, and then he did that twice. And you get skinny, but you don't stop. You know, you just keep going. It's a remarkable door. So in monasteries, this one chi, you hear of a practice and everybody says, oh, I want to do that too. Master Hua would say, these Americans will try anything, he said. <laughs> so we had sleeping sitting up in boxes on the roof and everybody had to build their sleeping sitting up box and put it on the roof. And yeah. So it's just this bodhisattva hears and sustains many gateways to the Dharma. So we have to use wisdom when you pick up one. Often more is not more. Sometimes more turns out to be less. Um, when instead instead of going broad, you go deep. In fact, there is a, uh, uh, a four-character phrase, a, a Buddhist code that says, I man shen ru. One practice deeply held, deeply mastered. And 
Master Hua would go back and forth in giving people advice because we would all say to him, sure, 84,000 Dharma doors, what's the best one for me? Right? Reinforce my ego, sure, I want, I want to be identified with the best Dharma door. Missing the point entirely. And uh, he would say, Yiman mm, Shanru, you should pick one and do it really well. Penetrate the husk of the watermelon. Don't keep running around the outside of the watermelon looking for something sweet. You know, Go through it and the sweet is inside. And then other times he would say, well, you, you know, it's good to, to have a variety. You can get stale, he would say. And he would advise people to do two or three. It was never fixed uh, how the answer would come. And interestingly, you know, I'm describing precisely what our sutra is talking about, where people come to the teacher, our bodhisattva paradigm here, and they say, I, I have some doubts about my practice. What should I do? And the bodhisattva goes, Bong! single sound, cuts the doubts, makes them very happy. Right? Master Hua would do that for us. And we would pepper him with, oh, sure, we, we, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, Exemplar, the famous case of when more becomes less, was uh, our young novice monk from Omaha, whose name I won't mention, who was not immune to um, a little bit of competition, but he was mostly just, he wanted to, he left home and he wanted to really do it right. He wanted to not waste time being vigorous. So we were ordaining. It was coming up to the ordination at City of 10,000 Buddhas, and he was in line to ordain. And uh, before the ordination, we were having a Chan, a summer Chan retreat. So he said, I want to definitely do the Chan retreat, but I think I want to fast at the same time, 18-day fast. <laughs> we said, hey, um, mm, I don't, don't even bother, Shurfu. I'll tell you, pick two out of three, or maybe one out of three, just leave home. Don't do the Chan and fast and leave home at the same time. Not a good idea. You will not succeed at that, chances are, unless you're a, some monster marine cultivator. And, and he said, no, no, I've got to do it. I'm going to do it. Can't, birth and death comes quickly, he said, you know, quoting Six Patriarch Sutra. And I mean, no, just bad idea, you know, go long. Go long. Look, look ahead. Put your eyes on the horizon, not just... You can't jump to enlightenment in a weekend. So what happened? Fasted during a Chan session in preparation for leaving home and all the work and exhausted himself. Sure enough, uh, some, some work had to be done at the Great Compassion Quad and he was so, so fatigued he climbed up a ladder to replace a light bulb outside the dining hall, fell off the ladder, severely sprained his ankle, and couldn't do the Chan session, couldn't do the, 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 uh, the fast, couldn't complete the fast, because he, he had to go to the hospital to get it treated. And for his ordination, he was in a cast, <laughs> stumping on crutches for his ordination. So, yeah, yeah. This bodhisattva... Uh, sustains many gateways to the Dharma and does it in a sustainable way. Right? By saying this, I'm not discouraging people from cultivating deeply, but you want to do it wisely and also plan ahead, pace it out. Uh, every step into our qi qi and mao bing, every step that we take into taming our bad habits and kind of uh, sh giving shape to our uh, to our desires, transforming them, usually generates backlash inside our nature. So get ready for that and don't be knocked off your feet. How hard is cultivation? Oh my goodness. Cultivation's hard, right? If you're really doing it. Because we're from beginning to the middle to the end, it's only dealing with our, with our own minds. So, how funny. All those practices have a single purpose, which is to transform ignorance. How many do we need? Right? 
oh, I recite the Buddha's name, but that's old hat, right? Oh man, when you see Amitabha, you just want to say his name once. You say it ten times, you're saved, right? Amitabha, limitless light. Oh, but that's just, that's just Amitofo, right? I want something magic. <laughs> so, my goodness. Shi fang wu liang zhu zhong sheng, xian lai qin jin hui zhong zuo, yi nian sui xin, ge wen nan, yi yin pu dui xi chong zu. Should limitlessly many beings throughout the ten directions gather to sit in his, her assembly, she responds with only one thought to each of their challenges, and with only one voice, she replies and satisfies them completely. Okay, there it is. That's the verse that carries the story that I've been telling everybody about this chapter from when we first started previewing it and then getting into it. Now we're almost done with it. This is it. This is the how's that again part of this chapter. And here's the devas. I'm, I'm reading you the songs sung by deva women in the sky praising the, the bodhisattva and the Buddhas. What is it? Should limitlessly many beings come and sit in the Bodhisattva's assembly? They have questions, they have doubts. The Bodhisattva goes, Ah, oh, got it. I understand all of your questions. And goes, Ah. One voice. Everybody goes, Whoa, I never saw it that way. Thank you. That's wonderful. Right? There it is. How cool is that? So uh, this week, one of my former students came through. She's now a, a professor at a university in Nebraska. And she's very active in uh, providing a, a rounded education for the students that come to her school. She takes trips to China, going to Japan this year with her students, field trips. So. She was relating uh, the, the, the gap between the Buddhism that you meet in your textbook and that you might study as a philosophical system and the reality of actual Buddhist practice that she introduced her students to. And she's a vegan. And she came with her 14-month-old daughter who is a cradle vegan. No milk, right? No dairy in this kid, in this cutest little Leo baby. Oh my goodness. And healthy and chubby, and, but has never touched milk or dairy, meat or dairy. So what is it like? She said, yeah, yeah. She says, when my students uh, go to China, um, I took them to a convent, to a nunnery, in, uh, somewhere in, in uh, Wuhan, and they were kind of, they weren't quite ready. When we had lunch at the nunnery, the nuns said, we eat in silence. And you know what else the nuns said? We don't waste food. <laughs> exactly what we say every Saturday here to, at our uh, lunches. And she's, there's one more, she said. There's very little choice. You eat what you're served, Right? That's what was cooked that day because that's what was the nuns were given. So she says her American college students from Nebraska line up for lunch and they're told, shh, no talking. And they're told, you left food on your plate, eat it. And they're told, if they don't like it, that's all there is. Go hungry if you don't want it. Right? And these kids can't believe that they're being shaped and disciplined and put in line by the practices of the, the convent. Why? She said, I talked to them afterwards and they were honest with me because that's the way I keep my relationships with my students. They said, but we, we thought they'd be thrilled to have American college students visiting this dump, you know, this place. I mean, how, how many times do they get to see American college students coming, you know? <laughs> They were, they were feeling full of privilege, right? And masters of the world. And they were being told that 
their behavior was was faulty. They left. They they were going to throw food away. They were unhappy with the choice, and they didn't want to be told to be quiet at lunch. So, and she, of course, she was she wasn't doing it super critically. She but she was commenting on the the collisions of realities. Right, the reality. What do you call that when you come to lunch, and you're silent, you don't waste, and you're content and grateful? It's called cultivation. Why? It's a little bitter, a little bit of bitterness. That's real cultivation, which is what going against the grain a little bit. What is what is habit wants you? Oh, I, yeah. Oh, this this food really sucks. You know, it's not very good. Got some uh, Sri Racha I want to put, you know, here. You know, hey, have you got more? Did you get that big apple? I saw that apple. G- give me that apple. You know. Shh! And then you throw food away. I just t- terrible. I dump, you know. So that's a little bit bitter, right? To be told that your behavior needs to conform to the standard. Ah, cultivation right there. What is uncomfortable? The me, full of desire, right? I want this. And you're told, well, you can't have that. Live with it. That's real cultivation. That's bitterness. So different from this heroic vision of, you know, I'm going to get enlightened this afternoon. You know, no, no, no. Just, just get in line and do what everybody else is doing. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. Especially for young people who were raised to limitless access, limitless desire. Right? I can afford to buy any. I can buy this place. You know, don't tell me no. Right? How interesting that that is the that's the cutting edge of where where Dharma really starts to pinch the self, and if you can take the joke. If you can recognize what that's about, you have made progress in cultivation right there because you have deflated the big me that wants everything the way I want it now. Get out of my way. You know? How interesting. And, and she was very hip to that and told me the story. I thought, yeah, perfect, perfect illustration of, of the reality of practice. So This bodhisattva can make a single sound and living beings go, oh, perfect. That's wonderful. Thank you for explaining that. Okay, more more goddesses songs. Next one, here we go. Ready? Zhu yu ci di wei fa wang, sui ji hui yo wu yan juan. Ri ye jian fo wei cheng she, ru shen ji mie zhi jie tuo. When she stays on the stage, she serves as a Dharma king. She answers beings' needs, teaches and guides them, and never grows weary. By day and night, she sees Buddhas and never leaves them. She masters the liberation of Nirvana's wisdom. Okay, this is one of the refrains. Um... Right. So our our devis, our goddesses, are coming up with the line that occurs in each of the stages where they talk about um, kind of steps out of the flow of the narration, the narrative, and talks about how the bodhisattva um, physically lives as he or she studies the ninth stage. He serves as a Dharma king, Fa Wang. There's um, the Fa Wang and the Fa Wang Zi, the Dharma prince. And this Dharma king, king of Dharma, kings, we don't have many kings. We have a king of Spain, king of Sweden. We have a queen in England, right? We have an emperor in Japan. But the, the Dharma king is the one who rules over all of this wisdom. 
And as the Dharma king, our Bodhisattva does what? Answers needs. Teaches. Guides. Never gets tired of it. By day and night, this Bodhisattva is sustained because now he can see the Buddhas. Not just a fantasy. He really sees the Buddhas teaching. And he never leaves them. So he's always next to that light. And he masters the liberation of Nirvana's wisdom. He knows how to end suffering. Doesn't hurt for this Bodhisattva anymore. Never has a bad day where he's kind of moody uh, and doesn't quite know why or bored, right? Just like all that is gone now. And yet still a body and a mind. Pretty amazing how this knowledge works. Um, just getting on, uh, Jin Wei Shi and I traveled to Washington, D.C. and to New York last week. I'm going to show some photos later. And we were counting. We, uh, let's see, how did it go? We, uh, in order to, to go and come back, we had to go to, go to, from Oakland Airport to Atlanta Airport to Dulles Airport to Atlanta Airport to LaGuardia Airport to Nashville, to Newark Airport to Nashville Airport, to Oakland Airport. That was one trip. And every one of those airports involved getting in line. Group A, Group A 1 to 30, welcome aboard. Group, group A 31 to 64, please prepare. You know. And all those airports, every single time we get on board, and we, you know, you line up on the jetway, and you got your bag and you come along and you step into the body of the airplane and here's the steward or the, the chief steward or the, the, or the flight attendant. And they go, they're just cheerful. Welcome. Nice to see you. Hello. And they're friendly. And they help everybody, you know, that life and death struggle getting your rollerboard on you know, with the overhead bin. And they have to always struggle with people who seem to be only thinking of themselves as, you know, not willing to, to be flexible. And then everything involved, feeding us, giving us drinks, dealing with problems, medical emergencies, you know. And we land and we're like, get us off the airplane, you know. And they say, bye, thank you for coming. And then you know what? The next group comes. And the, the flight attendants, hi, welcome. Come on. Four or five times a day, they have to go through that very nervous making, very high pressure, stressful, stressful environments where they work. I was really sympathizing with the flight attendants because they, people treat them like dirt. And all of the frustration and fear, many people are afraid of that experience, comes vented out on these hardworking people and they have to be kind of welcome. And they, like me, one passenger, they see 500 in a day, you know, five flights, a hundred more people. How easy it would be to get weary, to get really weary of that. And uh, there was an actual, uh, I read an article by a uh, Tips for Frequent Flyers on the, the Chronicle. The San Francisco Chronicle has a, uh, an active travel writer. And he was saying, you want to get better service on the airplane? Bring some chocolate. Bring a Hershey bar for the flight attendant. Give, give the flight attendant, buy three Hershey bars and give one each. Say, thank you for your service. Hand it to him. He said, you'll get a free drink probably out of that. You know? Or at least you'll get attentive service. Because people don't, don't treat attendants nicely at all, even politely. You know? But ask them how their day is going and uh, certainly do what they say. Listen to them when they give the safety instructions, even though you've heard it before. You know, they mostly only talk to the tops of heads. Nobody listens while they're telling you about this, how to buckle your seatbelt and go into your life vest, you know. So uh, I was trying that and beat their eyes when they're, you know, and it, it can help and it just relieves the, the stress. So here's our bodhisattva who answers beings' needs, teaches and guides, and never grows weary. Can you imagine? And he's, she's, pulling people out of their habits. How hard. By day and by night, but 
this is how he does it, he's got the strength of Buddhas supporting him. He's not he's never quote in the dark. He knows that every Buddha that's ever been has walked this path before him. We're on that path now. People who what what could you have done with your Saturday night other than listen to the Abhidhamsaka Sutra? You came to listen to the Sutra tonight, my goodness. And that's what Buddhas, present Buddhas did in the past. Was they listened to the to the Buddha's wisdom and one Su Xiu heard it, thought about it, put it into practice. So yeah. That's where his strength comes from. Okay. We'll do we'll do one more verse. We have to save some for next week because we've got um uh, the the tenth stage is coming right up. We're almost done with the ninth stage. We'll do one more here. Page ninety six. Ready? Gong Yang Zhu Fu Shan Yi Ming Ru Wang Ding Shang Miao Guan Miao Bao Guan Fu Shi Zhong Sheng Fan Nao Mie Pi Ru Fan Wang Guang Pu Zhao Making offerings to Buddhas increases his light of wholesome qualities. The way a fine crown adorns a king's head. He further helps all beings to end their afflictions. Just as a Brahma heaven king's radiance shines on every side. Now, for this analogy to work, you have to know how Brahma heaven kings shine. We don't. But apparently, according to the sutra, they, they shine. They really they light up. So making offerings to Buddhas increases his light of wholesome qualities. This Bodhisattva still makes offering. He's almost a Buddha himself, and he's there diligently offering what? Flowers, incense, water, food, lights, candles, lamps, clothing, all of the things that don't take a lot of money, but they take sincerity. And Bodhisattva is also making the offering of Dharma. Making the Bodhi resolve, crossing beings over, never retreating from that initial resolve. All of those things that are hard to give up, this Bodhisattva gives to the Buddhas, makes it easier to give them up. Making offerings to Buddhas increases his light of wholesome qualities, the way a fine crown adorns a king's head. Two analogies, right? The... uh, the light of wholesome qualities shines from his nature the way a crown on a king's head shines. We don't have that many king's crowns to compare with, but boy, I do. I One of my very, very favorite places to look at crown jewels was in a monastery, actually, Montserrat, above Barcelona. Benedictine monastery that's been there since the 1300s, remember? They had a little museum down below. Because the kings of Catalonia had supported that monastery for hundreds and hundreds of years doing merit uh, inside of Catholicism by emptying out their treasury, giving gold to the church. And the church, the monastery had been there so long that, and there had been so many kings coming and going that they had an incredible collection of crown jewels. And, uh, you know the real deals of the kings of Spain and Catalonia. So uh, they had bulletproof glass and armed guards <laughs> standing there. Apparently the robbers come to uh, score the crown jewels too. But these, seeing these incredible uh, tiaras and breastplates made of solid gold encrusted with rubies and and uh, the finest of handwork from goldsmiths and jewelers and silversmiths and just the, uh, not only kings, but the kings of the church. The Catholic Church uh, is second to none in outfitting their priests and bishops and cardinals and popes with the finest of jewels. So, oh my, the... uh, 
completely dazzling. You know, I've, I've been to the Uffizi Palace in Venice and I've been in, uh, uh, in Florence and I've been to the Louvre in Paris and seen their collections of royal jewelry, right? Crown jewels. Uh, but Montserrat in Barcelona has some of the finest, finest of uh, outrageous jewels, right? And boy, oh boy. So you have to go to where they are to see them because because they're royal jewelry, they're always out of reach. You can't get to them. But if you've seen them, uh, in the Louvre, I had that experience. I talked about it before. Is looking at, at the uh, crowns of the French kings and seeing how rough gold is. Gold is a very pliant metal. It's soft. And the crown, it, I was expecting something really seamless and fine, kind of like, you know, porcelain that comes with a sharp edge. It wasn't. It was rough and had been obviously hammered in. And it was not, not what I thought. That the gold has the quality that can turn people's hearts upside down, turn their eyes red. Some people get drunk on gold and intoxicated and uh, obsessed with it. It's, uh, when it's pure and fine, it's powerful. And so here were these, looking through the bulletproof glass at the Louvre, in the Louvre at the, uh, the crown of King Louis something or other, and seeing this raw, you know, golden fillet with incredible studied gems on it and thinking people would die for that, you know, and did. The, the bloody history in royal families of killing for the crown, you know, is go on forever. So making offerings to Buddhas increases his light of wholesome qualities the way a fine crown adorns a king's head. Ami Tofo. He further helps beings to end their afflictions. Amen. That's why a bodhisattva is honored. He doesn't run to nirvana first. Instead, he helps beings end their afflictions. So the nirvana of the bodhisattva is complete. Anuttara samyak sambodhi, the highest of awakening. Just the way, analogy number two, the way a Brahma heaven king's radiance shines on every side. We know that uh, in the Brahma heavens, they're already above the sun and the moon. So the light comes from the devas' bodies. What a concept, right? And uh, Master Hua would tell you that everybody's body radiates. Usually, most people are kind of yellow, he said. The light of your nature, kind of yellowish, pale. And if somebody is really cultivated, they tend towards white and you know there's all these pictures of chakras that have different colors and the chakra on the crown is supposed to be purple purple light but what is ignorance avidya right wuming it's precisely what covers up that light so it doesn't shine and uh, when somebody is really cultivated even though my rough physical eyes can't see it, there's some sensor in us, some mm, radar that can feel the virtue of someone. And Master Hua would say that virtue is just a light. Master Empty Cloud, for example, was said to be that kind of person that even from the back, when his back was turned to you, you could feel him. You knew he was there. Because you may not have seen purple light radiating from his body, but somehow you feel it. You feel goodness. And it's not makeup. It doesn't come on with blusher or, you know, lipstick. It's, it's there from the bones. Um, so that's the benefit of cultivation. It's real. This is real stuff we're talking about, not fantasy. Right? So... Why, when you meet someone, do you trust them implicitly? 
something about him. I don't know, uh, some charisma, we say. We have words to describe it, but what are we actually sensing? Uh, people who have that ability to command. They say one word, not loudly, but at the right time, and you follow. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Right? That quality. Uh, we do have words for it, virtue. You know. Uh, so this bodhisattva, as he or she cultivates, has been pulling that ignorance off. And so now, the sutra gives us an analogy. He shines like a Brahma heaven king. So, in the future we can check it out. First, when we meet our first Brahma heaven king, we can say, I remember the sutra talked about you, that nine stage bodhisattva shines like you. What are Brahma heaven kings like? They're in meditation all the time. They're in samadhi. That's the dhyanas. The first dhyana, second dhyana, third dhyana, fourth dhyana happen in the Brahma heaven realm. The called the si uh, chie, the form realm. Beyond Mara. When you get to that Brahma heaven realm, you've already transcended Mara's ability to to pull you back. Could I invite you to turn to page 14 in your songbook? You got a songbook there. Oh, I'll be 
just kind of brushing up on some songs that we're going to be recording soon. This is Wang Shi Suo Zhao, Zhu E Ye, Jie Yu Wu Shi Tan Chen Chi, Song Shen Yu Yi, Zhi Suo Shang, Samantha Bhadra's repentance verse from the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, chapter 40, in the verses part. And I wrote this in uh, my first trip to Gold Coast, Vihara, otherwise known as Sharangama. It's not the Gold Coast Vihara, it's called Sharangama Monastery, actually, now. And uh, um, I borrowed. Uh, Gordon Lightfoot's early morning rain, and so I have to be careful when I how this is uh, handled because it's not my melody. But I remember at the time there were two choices. There was a Celtic version, a Celtic musical setting that we tried for this. For all the harmful things I've done with my body, speech, and mind. From beginningless greed, anger, and stupidity, through lifetimes without number, to this very day, like that, and it was like people went, nah, nah. Gordon Lightfoot, stick with early morning. Right? So. This, uh, you know, never mind the setting for it. This particular verse is extremely effective. This is when I, I did a pilgrimage at one point in my career as a monk, as an early formative phase, and I recited this verse with every bow, eight hours a day for two and a half years. So I recited this particular verse a lot, but in Chinese. So to be able to have it in English is, I think uh, I have high hopes for this being also uh, transformative for people. We'll do it three times. Over all the harmful things I've done With my body, speech, and mind In the screen Anger and stupidity without the to this very day I now repent and I vow to change entirely For all the harmful things I've done With my body, speech, and mind Beginningless greed Anger and stupidity Lifetimes without number To this very day I now repent and I vow to change entirely. Oh, 
all the harmful things I've done With my body, speech and mind the screen anger and stupidity times without to this very day I now repent and I vow to change entirely last two lines again I now repent and I vow to change entirely. So that's early morning rain. Everybody, anybody remember early morning rain? Anybody old enough? No. In the early morning rain. With a dollar in my hand. Gordon Lightfoot, one of Canada's proudest sons. Sons of whom Canada should be proud. Um, while we're at it, let's do one more. Let's see here. Um, when was the last time we heard Yashoda Rock? Remember? Long time? Everybody familiar with page 24? is saying goodbye to his wife. He's sneaking out under cover of darkness, jumping over the wall, cutting off his hair, saying goodbye to his favorite horse, and uh, resolving to cultivate in the woods. Six years later, came the Buddha. One of the proud moments around this song was having uh, Ajahn Amaro, you know, the Theravada monks don't sing popular music or anything other than chanting. But that doesn't mean they don't listen when they get the chance. So uh, one day, oh, by the way, this coming Tuesday is the first Tuesday and Ajahn Pasano will be here. So people, he has not been uh, in the Bay Area for some time. So you have a chance Tuesday night, come listen to Ajahn Pasano. Uh, but uh, Ajahn Amaro uh, came with a group of monks and there were some of the monks were visiting and Ajahn Amaro said, uh, Reverend Hung Shur, would our, our Bhante here has not heard Yashodara. Could you sing it for him, please? <laughs> he wanted me to, to uh, speak Dharma with music for a monk, which he could not do himself. So... The song is requested by the Theravada Bhikkhus. I like that. Prince Siddhartha had a wife. He loved her like he loved life. He was fine and she was fair. And when he said goodbye, he said to her, Yes, show. Look at where life leads. Yes, show. I'm going I took a little trip into town I learned that death will cut us down I woke up by the city wall Freedom to die is no freedom at all 
the shoulder up. Look at where life leads your shoulder up. I'm gonna try to get free. Like you, I never heard an old man sigh. I never knew that people died. I never heard a sick man moan. Today I learned this body ain't my home. You show. Death is haunting me, your shoulder up. Love won't set us free. Then I saw another man who walked in robes with bowl in hand. His gaze looked neither left nor right. His brow was clear, his eyes were bright. Asked him what he did all day. He said, I cultivate the way. Wash my mind, wash my breath, and in the end, it's life and death. Yes, shoulder up. I couldn't love you more. Yes, shoulder up. That's why I'm walking. Some will say that I'm a fool. Some will say that I'm too cruel. This is the best thing I can do. When I get free, I'll come back for you. You show. Look at where life leads. You show. I'm going to try. So, with the benefit of this beautiful Taylor 12-string guitar, we're going to do the dedication of merit, and then I'm going to go turn on the projector and share some stories and pictures, if you all will indulge me. It's the back of your songbook, if you don't know it, dedication of merit, and we do this with a thought. This is interactive. You have to do a part of this, which is you send out all of the goodness that you care to send out that comes from listening to the Flower Garland Sutra together with Wholesome Dharma Friends on a Saturday night here in downtown Berkeley, which includes Wholesome Dharma Friends in China who are listening, benefited by volunteers in Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia who are translating. Did Jerry, do we have totals? 64. Okay. Okay, ask Cliff how many are listening. So there's a lot of goodness in bringing the texts forward in a variety of languages. And uh, you can share that. That goodness is giveawayable. You can share it. You can donate it out with a wish, however you'd like people to receive it. And uh, the, that merit actually changes things in the world. Twenty-nine from China. So please make that wish. Here we go. Away to great compassion with 
the guitar and the same tuning that I originally recorded that on the Paramita CD. So if that sounded familiar, that's why. That's the same instrument. All right. Um, let's get the show on the road and we'll do announcements after. The uh, Buddhist Association of China um, organized a three-country forum in New York, and we were part of the planning. So Jinwei Shi, myself, Madalena, Tom, uh, Amy, Zhang Chen, and as you see, Bhikshuni Hung Liang and a red dragon, and also Hung Jiao Shi traveled to Washington, D.C. first to Abhatamsaka Vihara down in, in Maryland to greet uh, our guests from China who, who first came to D.C., then up to New York. And uh, I'll just, these, are, these are photographs by Jinwei Shi's camera. And you're looking at the United Nations. This is out my hotel window. We, we stayed at the the hotel right outside the UN. And the, um, there we go. Now, the, let me tell you a little bit about it. This three country forum, Canada, US, and China, was designed in two parts. One, the first day, was to meet at the United Nations and give our talks and our exchanges and our cultural encounters and all. And that went well. But there was another part of the program which was a performance of Chinese Buddhist music. And it was organized by our friends from Lingyan Monastery, Master Guangchen, who was here for Shifu's 100th anniversary centennial. People remember Guangchen Fa Shi. And I've, uh, he and I have uh, encountered each other frequently because he invited me back to Lingyan Monastery to, to teach, etc., etc. So we become friends over the, the years. And he paid for Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center is what? That's in the middle 65th Avenue, 65th Street and Broadway in New York. It's the premier entertainment venue for much of New York, including Metropolitan Opera is right there. New York Philharmonic is right there, and the great stage for theater is right there. So uh, we rented the Geffen Hall at $35,000 a night to do two performances of Chinese Buddhist music. 
And the, um, it included, as you see, eight Shaolin monks, uh, 40 Chinese monks in the chorus, uh, four Tibetan lamas, and I guess no, six lamas, and six Theravada monks from China, from Yunnan. And what a show. They rehearsed hard, they were very sincere, and it was a really good show. What you're seeing right now on the screen is a little church in Brooklyn, uh, right down by the cross from the Statue of Liberty, uh, where we rehearsed in the church basement. And here's what it sounded like. This is a song written by Master Guangchen, and it sounded really nice. This is the opening number. Now, along with the uh, singers and the martial arts monks, there was an orchestra from Da Xiang Guo Si, which is a 2,000-year-old monastery that the emperor began uh, 2,000 years ago from the Han, and he kept his own Buddhist orchestra of monks really playing. And these are real monks. There was nobody in this entire group that was not an actual left-home person. And the tradition of monks playing music has continued. And boy, the orchestra from Da Xiang Guo Si was really outstanding, playing traditional instruments. The Di Zi and the Ran and the Gu Zheng and the Pi Pa, right? So here they are. <laughs> This is Master Xin Yin. He and I were co MCs. And this is the first time we'd met each other, much less done our, our thing. <laughs> Introducing every act. He in Chinese, me in English. Everything that begins must come to an end. Every gathering ultimately. This was the goodbye speech. So here's Amy. Now these are photos by Jin Wei Shi, and what's fun about these is you get to see backstage. Uh, you get to see the monks uh, off stage, so to speak. They're not guarded at all and very candid. This is Master Yenji, the, the chair, vice chair now. We went down to Wall Street for a meeting at the Episcopal Trinity Church. Here's the orchestra members with their guzheng and their ding bong. The MC. Intense martial artist. Look at those symbols. Bong. This is a director from uh, Hangzhou Television. He's the generation of Zhang Yimou, right? And uh, he rallied the troops like a general rallies, you know, his soldiers. He was saying, 
You all don't know where you are. He says, New York is the number one city in the world. Lincoln Center is the number one performance venue in the world. You've come to the top. Are you going to let China down? No, you're not. You're going to show Chinese culture at its very best. You know, and everybody like straightening up. I guess he's right. We are, aren't we? Yeah. We, you know. He was very intense and, and did a really great job of getting people p primed for this show. And it worked. They, they performed really thoroughly and, and uh, convincingly, right? Here is Master Guangchen doing the same thing, giving them exhortation, right? We're in this little church basement in, in Brooklyn doing the rehearsal. And when I heard their show the day before, I knew they were ready for Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center is a huge venue, 2,000 seats, and, and uh, the, the energy in the church basement was full enough to fill Lincoln Center. It was clear that they could do it. Here he is, Chen Taman, big horn, six-year-old. He was the, everybody, oh. Yeah. Really, really flexible. Oh my goodness, that kid could do it. Here's a shot, martial artist, pouring tea, playing a flute. This is the Shurfu, the real Shurfu at Shaolin Monastery, who appeared with the kid, but he also taught all the other martial arts monks over the years. Here's the orchestra from Da Xiang Guo Si, the Ran, the Sheng, different instruments. They could pack up and travel really fast. Here's Madalena, Master Guangchen. Okay, here we are outside the UN. Lining up to pass inspection. Here we are inside, about to give our talks. Being interviewed by Chinese TV. This is... Uh, this is what it was like inside. I gave the talk on the Song of Enlightenment and made a lot of people laugh. Sing along. Here's the whole assembly outside. Where's the tall monk? Oh, there he is. That's me. And we were delighted that, oh, not that. Bhikkhu Bodhi was there. So when we did our, here's the rehearsal at Lincoln Center. Here's the actual performance. And here's the conclusion after the second show. We gave a dragon puppet to the little boy. Chin Wei Shi is here. <laughs> What are you laughing at? These are the Shaolin monks. Uh, there's, let's see here. While you dreamt you lived in all the six destinies, now you're awake. Oh, why the world they simply can't stand me? People are singing along. Right? So, yeah, hi, Paul. Do people recognize Ming Hai Fasher right here? 
from the uh, Salt Lake City. This is uh, Professor Tizer from Princeton. Here's uh, Chao Changfasher from Longhua Si in Shanghai. In stillness and tranquility, you never asked again. Your wisdom here was cold and thick, you never wiped it clean. Now it shines without a flaw, there's nothing you can see. <coughs> right? So, sing along in the UN, why not? Um, more of those photos. Here we go. Okay, this is uh, Porgy and Bess was happening at the Metropolitan Opera. Here we are rehearsing on stage. Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> Portraits of people at, you know, at their most intense. The performances went as as well as could be expected. This is backstage in the. Uh, in the wings waiting to go on. 
This is the Lao Shifu. Uh, his name is Yan Zhuang, and he is the actual teacher of the Shaolin monks. He's very uh, self-contained. His movements are, are slow and economical, right? People, if you know martial arts films, you know the work of Samuel Hong, Hong Sanbao. He's, this is, he, he was just that same way. There you go. This is uh, Fa Wang Si, where we went on Sunday morning. This morning I talked about this in our, in the talk. Uh, this is the this is the temple. It's an old Chinatown building. It's probably been there for a hundred years, and it's five stories. But the stairway was so steep. Uh, it was just a vertical stairway going up. It had been there forever. And if you go from no no elevator, if you go from ground level to fifth floor, you <laughs> you really get a workout just going up the stairs. Last picture, Shaolin monk with a dragon. We're going to try to send him one. He really liked that dragon. So there we go. That's the, oh, there's one more. There you go. <laughs> yeah, he got it right away. Okay, so that was that was the experience, and to uh, to have the to give a speech at the UN and and host two thousand people at Lincoln Center in the same day is not too shabby. Right? <laughs> oh my goodness! All right, so we have a lot to announce. Let's uh, run the screen up and turn off this guy. Uh, let's see now. We have a number of announcements. One is that tomorrow is going to be a Buddha recitation day. Uh, all day reciting, starting at 9, going until 4. You're welcome to come and, and join in. Um, there will be lunch provided. Uh, tomorrow, up at City of 10,000 Buddhas at DRBU, Marty Verhoeven is giving a, there's a reception for his photo exhibit. He took a bunch of uh, lovely photographs in Maine and there, a number of them were mounted and printed and mounted. They're up at uh, DRBU, there'll be a reception at three o'clock. Um, this time, let's see, next Saturday I will be here to take us out of the ninth stage into the tenth stage, haha. Uh -huh. And during the day, next Saturday is going to be a little different. Uh, we, we're not going to have our usual program because we'll be heading down to our monastery in uh, Boulder Creek. So if you come during the day next Saturday, no one's going to open the door for you. Don't take it personally. Uh, it's that we have a, an event out, outside. And I want to announce to people that our much appreciated novice monk, Qin Liang Shi, is on Tuesday going back to Malaysia. Uh, he's, we're changing his visa status and he has to be out of the country. So uh, we'll, we won't see his smiling face for a few months. And if anybody wants to... Uh, 
give his, if any of the lay people want to bow to the novice monk, you can do that. Um, or just to say bye to him because he'll be leaving on Tuesday. Um, we look forward to his quick return. Uh, he carries a lot of weight around here. So, um, Okay, what other announcements do we have? Jin Chuan? Yeah, Tuesday night, the monk, the monks from Abhayagiri will be here. Tea at five, and then Dharma talks. Uh, Ajahn Pasano is coming. Whether whether he does the talking, we'll we'll see. But he'll be coming. Oh, it's the first Tuesday of November, right? A um, little little louder, please. Can't can't hear. Oh, really? Three Tuesdays from now. Yeah. Hmm. No, two Tuesdays, right? Two? Okay. Yeah, today's the 19th. Okay, you're right. So, that's scratch that, run the tape back, delete that. When? Okay, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, City of 10,000 Buddhas, Dak Phai Wang the martial arts teacher and early disciple of Master Xuan Hua will be at City of 10,000 Buddhas. He's the uh, founder of the Plum Blossom School of Martial Arts, one of the world's largest and most popular. Uh, it's Choi Li Foot style. And uh, uh, is he was, along with Madalena, that first generation who welcomed Master Hua to America back in the early 60s. So he is, Dak Phai Wang's the real deal. And Oh, really? There's an online link. You can watch the events taking place at DRBU from your computer. So talk to Jin Chuan and he'll tell you how to do that. November 3rd. Okay. Um, I will be also talking about Master Hua's legacy November 3rd up at DRBU in Ukiah. That's a Sunday. Okay, I think we're good. Yes, next Sunday. We said Saturday next, no event here during the day. Lecture, yes. But uh, the next day, Sunday, is the family program that we do once a month. So that will be here on Sunday, next week. All right. Let's transfer the bow. We transferred, let's bow. See you next week.